Jesus said in John chapter 12, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That's what Jesus said. And that's what we're trying to do here at Emmanuel. Hello, my name's Pastor Bob Gray, and I'm glad that you've taken the time to join us for one of our services. Our goal here at Emmanuel is to lift up Christ, to lift him up so high that no matter where you're at right now, he will draw you closer to him. That's our goal. May you enjoy the services of Emmanuel. And if I can be of service to you, please let me know. God bless you. Enjoy the service. When they started out with those oohs and ahs, I was afraid they'd forgotten the words. Well, I'm already in a difficult position because I've been asked already tonight if I have a watch and does it work. And you'll never believe this, but dear sweet Mrs. Zinn was the one that asked me that. Yeah. And then Brother Juan Mayave came up to me and said, you're new here tonight, aren't you? There's a $20 visitor's fee. So and then if I, if I get out late tonight, it's not my fault. It's, it's uh, Brother Jordan's fault for taking so much time with the announcements. Amen. 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 Grab your Bibles and let's get going. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Some of you got naps this afternoon. I can tell because you're more alert lurking than you were this morning. Second Corinthians chapter 8, now. Pastors asked me to teach on this subject tonight, and so don't moan and don't groan. And whatever you do, don't get up and leave, okay? You'll get through this. I promise you, you will. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to talk to you about this, this matter of grace giving or faith giving. And we're going to look at what the Scripture has to say about it, beginning in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit... For we want you to know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So God wants us to know right away that he bestows grace on churches. The word bestow there is, means something like how God allows the dew to fall. So the grace of God upon the churches is kind of like the dew of heaven falling on the churches. Okay, so if I were a church, and we are, I would want to know what do I have to do to have the grace of God fall on me. Amen? Look at verse 2. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of the joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. That doesn't sound very positive at first. But just as a reminder to you, they had a great trial of affliction going on. At the same time, they had an abundance of joy. How does that happen? Only by the grace of God. Even though you and I might be going through a tremendous time of affliction, God shows us here that we can still have the joy of God. Because joy is not dependent upon our circumstances, but upon our relationship with Jesus Christ. Is everything good between you and God? Then you can have joy, regardless of the circumstances. Notice also it says they were in deep poverty. There's hardly anyone in the United States of America today who's in deep poverty. We are one of the most blessed nations on the face of the earth. Deep poverty is not something that we typically deal with. I found that out in Chicago on the bus route. I, I go to the homes of the kids and I'd say, hey, we're going to have junior camp next week and it's going to cost $50 a week for each camper. And the parents would look at me like, are you out of your mind? And so I'd say, I tell you what, I'll pay for the first one, you pay for the second one. And boy, as soon as I said that, mama would go running into the bedroom, grab her, her little coin chain, her purse out of the, 
out of the bedroom come running out and hand me $50. And while she's counting out $50, there's about $300 in her hand. She just conned me out of $50. Her kids are all wearing Jordan tennis shoes, and I'm wearing Walmart shoes. You with me tonight? So there's not a whole lot of deep poverty in the United States of America. Many times we think we're poor, but we're not poor compared to the rest of the world. But here God says that these people were in deep poverty, and yet watch what it says there, yet they gave liberally, bounded unto the riches of their liberality. So remember, I've said to you two or three times now, giving to missions has nothing to do with your money. It has everything to do with God's money and our faith. So can we trust God to give through us? That's the issue. In verse 3, it says that they gave beyond their power to give. They gave more than they had the ability to give, even though they're in affliction and deep poverty, they gave more than they were able to give. How did they do that? Because God gave it through them. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 8 teaches us. So they gave beyond their power. Look down at verse 5. How did this start? And this they did, not as we hope, but they gave their own selves to the Lord. So the first thing that happened is they were willing of themselves to give themselves to the Lord. You find that in verse 3. Then they gave their own selves to the Lord. Look at verse 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye gave. You have. So there's a readiness of the will that must happen. In 16 days from now, we will begin our missions conference 2021. And between now and then, what God is looking for is an entire church to become willing to be used. Willing. That's all. Just be willing to be used. And the question has to be asked this evening, are you and I willing for God to use us? If we are willing to be used, God will help us give beyond our power to give. And you say, Brother Moore, what does that mean? At the end of the year, you look back at what God channeled through you for missions, and you just shake your head and say, I have no idea how that happened. I have absolutely no ability to explain what God just did. And I want to tell you tonight, the, the most amazing thing in the world is to watch God do those kinds of things through you and me and look back at it afterwards and say, wow, what a miracle. And it is. How does this happen? His grace, his giving grace that we mentioned in verse 1. Look at verse 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. What grace? Giving grace. Look at chapter 9, chapter 9, and look with me at verse 8. Everybody there? Chapter 9, verse 8, and God is able to make all, what? All grace abound toward whom? You. That ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So God is able to make all grace abound toward us. Look at verse 14 of chapter 9. And by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. Here's what God says. He says, I have an abundance of giving grace. I'm looking for distributors through whom I can channel my giving grace. By faith, we offer ourselves to be used and God says when we do that, he will supply what needs to be given, and then we just give it. What kind of a deal is better than that? But it all comes down to being willing to be used. Now, 
It has been said by some people that for every New Testament principle is an Old Testament illustration. So would you, in your Bibles, please, go with me to 2 Kings and chapter 4. 2 Kings and chapter 4. A very familiar story to those of us who have been saved for any length of time. Read along with me, if you will, beginning in verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 4. Now they cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. When thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Oil must have been as expensive in those days as it is now. Now let's talk about the application of the story here in light of what we just saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. First of all, this is a very poor widow, not well-to-do. She's not a person of great means. She has two sons to care for. She's the widow of a Bible college student. The widow recognized her poverty and sought God through the man of God. Same thing Hannah did in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. Now I want you to look with me at verse 3. Because he says, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. Now I looked up that word vessel, and here's what it means. Something prepared. Something prepared. Vessels were to be used to meet the need. And I ask you this evening, church, are we willing to be used to meet an urgent need? This was an urgent need here. Getting the gospel to 8 billion people nearly is an urgent need. Are we prepared vessels in our mind and in our heart Are we prepared? That's what the word vessel means. I am sure that these vessels were clean. Somebody comes to your house, ladies, and says, can I borrow a bowl? You don't reach into a dirty dishwasher and grab the bowl and hand it to them with all the gunk on it because you haven't washed it yet. You don't loan out dirty vessels, amen? You don't loan dirty dishes. And so I'm sure these vessels were clean. But I also want you to understand, I'm pretty certain that these vessels were of all different kinds of shapes and sizes. You know, that's what happens with vessels. 
We look across the auditorium tonight, there are all different sizes and shapes of vessels. I'm not going down that road. At my size, I have no right to go down that road. Stop looking at me like that, Benson. The question has to be asked tonight. Are you and I vessels? And if we are, what is the purpose of a vessel? To be used. These vessels were in every size and shape. I can just imagine as she filled the vessels and maybe set them there on the floor, that there was every there was square ones and round ones and and uh, rectangular ones and there were skinny ones and there were uh, other ones and there were deep ones and shallow ones. But the bottom line here is there were vessels, and the vessels were what was needed. And these vessels, they seem to have been surrendered. In other words, the people willingly gave them to the widow. You and I must be surrendered vessels. We must willingly give ourselves to be used. In verse 3, he also emphasizes this, even empty vessels. What good is a vessel that's full? How could you put oil into a vessel that's already full? You wouldn't think he'd have to explain that, but I think we do have to explain that tonight. Because in order for us to be used as vessels, we must empty ourselves. We must be empty of ourself. Watch this. We must be empty of any agenda that we have. We must be empty of conflict. Conflict with brothers and sisters in Christ that hinder us from being used. We must be empty of disobedience. Vessels, in order to be used, must be empty vessels. And as I speak to you about that particular subject right now, what is it that the Spirit of God just smote you about? He does that, you know. He jumps up on your shoulder and he whispers in your ear, and he says, that's what you need to fix. That's what you need to clean up. Who is it you don't get along with? Who is it that you're critical of? What kind of divisiveness do you have in your spirit tonight? Negativity? Whining and complaining? All those things clog up a vessel so it can't be used. And many more things. I don't know. I'll just have to depend upon the Holy Spirit to show you what the problem is. But God is looking for clean vessels. I want you to notice also in verse 3, he said, borrow not a few. Now, that literally means, that expression means do not diminish. In other words, don't you and I put an unnatural cutoff on what God wants to do. Don't you and I say, okay, God, I'm willing to be used, but only this far. I will only go this far. I'll only get to this limit. God does not want you and I to put limits on our usefulness. Borrow not a few. So the question has to be asked tonight. How great is our vision for what God will do through us if we simply surrender ourselves to be a useful vessel? How hard are we willing to work? 
Then look with me at verse 4. Verse 4, and when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door. Oh, now there's something very, very important. You see, this business of being a vessel is a private matter. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6, it tells us when we pray, we're supposed to enter into our closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, thy Father which seeth in secret... He'll be there. This matter of being used as a vessel is a secret thing. It's a private thing. It's not something we run around telling everybody. Well, I asked God to use me, and God told me to do thus and so. No, 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 no. It's between you and God. He told her very clearly, shut the door. Shut the door. That's why we don't brag on how much money we give to missions. We don't boast about that because it's a private matter. God says, you and I'll take care of that. Amen. Some pretty interesting instructions here, are there not? So the question has to be asked tonight, how urgent are we? How urgent are we? How urgent is the gospel? And can we trust God to supply? Remember this morning, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Can we trust God? You know, people often ask me, I, I taught a class on prayer for over 20 years. One of the questions that was often asked to me about prayer is, uh, you know, what's the most interesting thing about prayer? Well, the most interesting thing that I've found about prayer is how little we understand that God wants to talk to us. You say, do you hear an audible voice? No, not yet but you will hear the voice of God in your prayer closet. What's that about, Brother Moore? It's when you and I say to God we want to be used, and we go to our prayer closet, and we ask God, how do you want to use me? You see, God already has a plan. And so there may be some here tonight under the sound of my voice, if you would really ask God, how do you want to use me, he would tell you he wants you to go to the mission field. <sighs> Not bad. Parents are cringing right now. Take my children out of the country to some foreign field? No, 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 no. You get a job as a lawyer. Become a doctor. Become a businessman. Make good money so you can take care of us when we're old. There are more young people not on the mission field today because of parents than because of the young people. Stop meddling with the will of God. The people under the sound of my voice, every single one of us, we come to the place where we go to God and we say, God, what is it that you want to do through me? How is it that you want to use me? I promise you, God will tell you if you really want to know. There's some young men in this building right now. God wants you to preach. There's some young couples. God wants you in ministry. He doesn't want everybody in ministry. I understand that. There are some young people in this room that God wants you on the mission field. Some of you know that he does and you're ignoring it. Some of you, he's speaking to you right now. You only have two choices when it comes to missions. You either go yourself or you send somebody. But we all have an obligation to the Great Commission. 
We all must be involved. We are all to be used vessels in some way. Far too much hiding from what God wants to do. You see, the need is urgent. Now, this lady was not someone with money or means. This was about someone with urgency and no provision. You understand what I'm saying? There was an urgent need and no provision. And it could be that there are some in this room, the need, you understand the urgency of the need to take care of the missionaries, but you have no provision. Good. That's what grace giving is all about. And there might be some, you have some means, but there's no, no way you can do what you believe God wants you to do. That's fine, too, because God can take care of that as well. It could be that you see the need of the world, but you have no means whatsoever. But God will take care of that. So the question is asked tonight, how urgent? Listen carefully to the question. How urgent is your desire for God to use you? I'm a farm boy from rural Maine. Not talented. Not particularly intellectual. You check my high school yearbook, you'd find that I was voted most likely to fail. I was an introvert. I didn't talk to people. I had farm chores to do. I went to school. As soon as school was over, I hurried home to take care of my chores. I didn't play sports other than Saturday morning intramural sports because my dad said, you don't have time. You've got too many chores to do. I live within my own private world. I was saved at the age of eight. I was faithful to church, sang in the junior choir. I wore one of those little smocks that they made you wear. That was so cute. I went off to college. They said, we want you to be a bus driver. I said, I can do that. I'd become a truck driver. I knew how to drive just about everything on the road, so I became a bus driver in the city of Chicago, picking up kids and teenagers, and honestly having the time of my life. After eight months of driving a bus, they called me, and they said, we want you to be a bus captain. I said, not interested. Get up, started to walk out. I said, hey, wait just a minute. You don't understand how things work around here. I said, sir. He said, if Brother Howes and I think you're ready to be a bus captain, you're ready to be a bus captain. I said, I'm not interested. I didn't ask if you're interested. Brother Howes wants you to be a bus captain. End of story. I said, okay, I'll be a bus captain. I left that office. Drove home to my house, had a big overstuffed chair in the living room where I would get on my face and pray every day. I buried my face in the seat of that chair, and I began to cry like a baby. God, I can't do this. There's no way I can do this. I'm not capable of doing this, but I don't have a choice. So with my tears soaking the cushion of that chair, I cried out to God, the only thing I knew to cry out to God, God, use me. I don't know how you're going to use me, but would you use me? God, please use me every single day of my life. And the prayer that I have prayed, prayed more than any other prayer in the last 45 years of my life is, God, would you use me? God, I'm nothing. I have nothing to offer. I have no money in the bank. I have no talent. I have no skill. I have nothing to offer you, God, but would you please use me? I go to my bus route. I knock on doors. 
My bus workers would leave and go home. I'd stay in Chicago until it was dark. I'd drive around the streets of my bus route. I'd park on a side street. I'd walk to the sidewalk or the steps in front of the house where some of my people live. And I would literally put myself face down on the sidewalk. And I would pour out my tears on that sidewalk and I would beg God, please use me, God. Please use me in the lives of these people. They need you. They need to be transformed by the power of your word. And I would cry and beg God, use me, please use me. Saturday night after Saturday night, I get on the bus on Sunday morning. And while the driver was driving, I would go through that bus and kneel at every position, every seat on the bus and bathe those tears seats with my tears and beg God to use me in the lives of those people this morning. I don't know any other way to live. There are some people who can do things on their own. They're gifted people. They have tremendous ability, and they live their entire life depending upon themselves and their abilities. But I don't know how to do that, and I don't think most of us in this room know how to do it when it comes to giving to missions. And what God is looking for is people whose hearts are broken with a desire and a passion. God, would you please take whatever I am and would you please use it? Would you please fill me with the power of God? Would you help me know the word of God? And would you somehow use my life to make a difference? I believe God looks tonight, and he has a question for you and me. How badly do you want me to use you? How urgent is the Great Commission to you? How much are you burdened about the lost people of the world? Can you trust me, God asks tonight, to use you how I want to use you? The need is urgent for several reasons. God wants the gospel to reach the world. We have a command called the Great Commission. This country needs to please God. And the way we've pleased God all these years is by obeying this book and sending the gospel to the world. Now more missionaries are leaving the field and going to the field. This church needs to, pre to please God and have the blessing of God on it. Each one of us need to please God and have his blessing on our lives. And my question to you tonight is very simple. Will you be a vessel? Will you be a vessel? Will you be prepared for him to use you? Will you be empty? Will you be urgent? It was a young lady that came from California to go to college. She was a third of three sisters. She had told her parents that she didn't want to go to college, and so they took all the money they'd saved for college, and they gave it to the two older girls. And then she came a year or two later and said, I think I want to go to college. They said, we have nothing for you. We can't help you in any way. She said, I'll go by faith. She came to college. She literally didn't have a dime. She couldn't afford to buy toothpaste. She couldn't afford to buy any necessities. Everything she needed, she had to pray down. One day I stood up in a meeting of bus workers and I said, uh, we need to help some people, and so I'm going to ask you if you'll make a, a faith commitment to help with this particular need. And this young lady, she took out a piece of paper and she wrote on it, 25 cents a week. 25 cents a week, that's all she could afford to do. One Saturday morning, I was rushing back to my office before the bus meeting, and I met her coming towards me. And her eyes are just as red and bloodshot as can be, and she's just crying, the tears running down her face. And I stopped her and I said, what's wrong? She said, I don't understand it, Brother Darrell. She said, uh, 
Every single week, God's answered my prayer and given me my 25 cents. But for some reason, this week, he only gave me 20. And I said, don't worry, the meeting hasn't started yet. It'll be okay. I continued on to my office, got back to the meeting room and stepped behind the pulpit. And on the pulpit was a little handwritten note from her. It said, he did. So I stopped her after the meeting and I said, what happened? She said, after I talked to you, I was walking down the hallway. I came around the corner and there was another a male student standing in the doorway of another room. And he was just flipping a coin up in the air and catching it, flipping a coin up in the air and catching it. And she said it was a penny. And he stopped her and he said, could you use this? She said, yes, I sure could. He dropped the penny in her hand. And then he said, well, if you can use that one, maybe you can use these two. And he dropped four more pennies in her hand. You see, she wanted so badly to be used. The tears were just flowing from her eyes like a river because it was the passion of her young life to be used by God. This morning I said to you, stop running and walk. Christians need to walk with God and hunger for God to use them. It is not about you. It is not about your lifestyle. It's not about how you live, whether you live comfortably or whether you struggle. It's not about that at all. It's about that one thing, that passion that's beating right now in your heart to be used by God. God could use me, Brother Moore. Yeah, if he can use an old farm boy like this, he can use you. You mean God really wants to use my life? He wants my life to count for the gospel. He wants my life to count for the world and the people in the world. God really wants to use me? Yes! But he will not force us to be used. He will not demand it. What he desperately needs his hearts that are filled with an uncontrollable desire. Use me. Dear God, please use me. God, when it comes to getting the gospel to the world, use me. I'm nothing. I have nothing that I know of to offer, but here I am. Use me. Are you willing to be a vessel? Will you pray for God to use you and for him to show you how? Thank you for being with us during this service. My prayer is always as I study that God would use his word to speak to people's hearts. And may you have a good day, a good week. Please know that if we can do anything for you here at Emmanuel, all you have to do is let me know. God bless you, my friend. Have a wonderful day.